This morning, when I use the term and the phrase being led by the Holy Spirit, where does your mind go? Is that a difficult place for you? It's kind of a gray area. It's kind of on the edge. I don't really want to be having to think about that. I don't see the Spirit, and He's leading me. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and He's leading me. I thought I had a say-so in my life. And I just feel kind of uncomfortable talking about that. We shouldn't. Because God's Word has revealed to us that indeed this is something that we better have happen in our life because in chapter 8 of Romans and verse 14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God these are the sons of God are you a son of God oh surely I am I'm a Christian I'm a child of God well you've been led by the Spirit well I'm still uncomfortable about it it shouldn't be. But I think it's something we're going to have to deal with because if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, I can only understand the word. I must not be a child of God. I'm not, we're not the sons of God. Well, I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit, but that seems kind of fuzzy. Then why does Paul reveal this in the 8th chapter of Romans? You're going to see a lot of prepositions called for, because, therefore. That's explaining to us what's involved with the Holy Spirit. By the end of this lesson, we'll look at six things the Holy Spirit does in this chapter that all ought to enrich your life as a Christian. Well, we'll shy away from the subject of the Holy Spirit because we know God says in a context that we are sons of God if we are led by the Holy Spirit. Where does it begin? Well, in chapter 8 and verse 2, it begins with the, re the revealing of the law of the Spirit of life. The law of the Spirit, it produces Life. We see that in Romans the 8th chapter in verse 2. There is therefore no condemnation to them in what relationship? To them that are in Christ Jesus. For explanation. Why is there no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus? For the law of the Spirit. It didn't say the Holy Spirit just by itself directly upon us. No, it says the law of the Holy Spirit. That's what was revealed, handed down from God to man. Who is involved in revealing that law? It's the law of the Spirit. What does it produce in our life that I have no condemnation, I'm not being condemned, what do I have? It produces life. So it all begins there. And what a contrast from Romans 7, which was read in your hearing this morning. Where Paul looked at himself as he really is in the sense of the fleshly part of him and the spiritual part of him, he calls the mind and the flesh. Verse 18, in me there is no good thing, meaning in his flesh. Now he's not talking about his physical flesh. God made us and everything good. He's talking about that person that is the fleshly mindset, and there is the spiritual mindset that's right with God. And they're conflicted with one another. And on that fleshly side, there's not a good thing about it. Not a good thing. Because that mind is totally going against God. And what the law of the Spirit of life did, it redeemed us from this second law, not the law of Moses, he redeemed us from the law of sin that produces death. That's what we see in Romans 7, 23 and 24. Wretched man that I am, who shall save me from the body of this death? 
I delight in the law of the law, Lord, verse 20, in my inward man, there's that mind that's on the right side of the thing, but I have a different law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing captivity, being under captivity of the law of sin, what does it produce? The next verse, death. That's when, when I sin, he's got me. The law of sin that produces death. I don't have that anymore. I don't, therefore, I don't think he's speaking in Romans 7 about the life of a Christian. Some do. I don't know a Christian that said, wretched man that I am. No, you've been redeemed. But what he doesn't say that we quit fighting the battle of, 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 of flesh as we become a Christian. I'm not saying that. I've been redeemed from something. I've been made free from something and that I'm no longer under condemnation, which I was under this law of sin that produced death. But now I'm free from that. I'm not a wretched man, but now, but now, contrast. Now I have no, there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life, there's your gospel message has made me free from the law of sin and death. Because what the law could not do, there's your law, Moses. That's the idea of maybe God's law. That's any law. What the law could not do, why? Because it was weak through the flesh. The law was set forth by God to accomplish exactly what he wanted to accomplish. Bring forth the, the information and to really bring forth the idea that you need a Savior. Because no one kept it perfectly except Jesus. And that law was weak to justify us because we don't do all things all the time in the law. And when we sin one time, we're under the law of sin and death then. It's got a hold. Our flesh has won out. But here's the law of sin and death, and the law was weak through the flesh because the flesh is weak. You see that in Romans 7. But that's what you once were. But now we've got the law of the spirit of life. We've got a new beginning in Romans 8. And he says in verse 4 that the ordinance of the law, he sent his son, verse 3, as, as, as uh, in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He paid the penalty for our, our sins. That the ordinance or the requirement of the law, as your law of Moses, might be fulfilled in us who do what? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So here's the beginning. And it has freed me from that law of sin. See, sin is personified. It has a law that it works through my flesh, and when I give in to the flesh, it's got me. It produces death. The wages of sin is death. And the law that was given, as from the law of Moses, and Paul indeed was under that, he was indeed coming along after that, through Christ had been uh, saved you from it, but he was guilty of sin as a Jew and he had come out of that he said but now there's no condemnation because we're walking according not to the flesh see we've changed we're not we're not like we were in Romans 7 I'm not as helpless in Romans 7 either I've got I, we're walking according to the flesh some of your versions have that in the very first two verses but most of the manuscripts have it here but the truth is here, that indeed we are going to be walking according to Spirit. So when does that begin? When I am a son of God. We must be a son of God because 1 John 3, 1 says, But now are you children of God, or what manner of love that you should be called children of God, and such are you. You are a son of God. We're Christians. You can't be one unless you're led by the Spirit. Well, I am. I submitted to the law of the spirit of life. I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, who told me my 
remedy because Jesus died for me so he could fulfill the requirements of the law so I could be justified by my faith in him. And you know what? That's how I become a child of God because in Galatians 3.26, I read, For your sons of God by faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. I'm a Christian. That's where you begin. Nothing mystery about that. No mystery about that other than the mysterious plan of God that's been revealed now. He didn't say the spirit of life. He said the law of the spirit of life made me free from the law of sin and death. Secondly, when I'm being led by the Holy Spirit, my life is going to be characterized in the right way. It's characterized by walking according to what standard? It's going to be walking according to the Spirit, not according to my desires of the flesh. We see that in Romans 8 and verse 4. I don't walk according to the flesh. We pick up in verse 5. For explanation. Why, do, why is this such a mystery? He doesn't want it to be a mystery. He's explaining one thing right after another. For they that are after the flesh mind the things that are of the flesh. And he said, but they that are after the Spirit, walking according to the Spirit, where is their mind? They mind the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death. See, it's the law of the Spirit. It's not the, the law of the Spirit, but it is indeed the, the law, the flesh, minding the flesh. It's the law of sin and death. I'm giving it into the flesh. So, but the flesh is death. But the mind of the Spirit is, is what? It is life and peace. I'm born again. I'm in Christ. It wasn't direct operation of the Holy Spirit. It was submitting to the law. And now I'm walking according to the Spirit's direction in that gospel. And I, I'm living the life of a Christian that I, I, should be, I should be living. And knowing that if you are going to mind the things of the flesh, he says it is not subject to what? It's not subject, in verse 7, to the Spirit. It's to the Spirit in some nebulous way. No, you're not subject to the law of God. And number two, next verse, you cannot please God. When you're walking that way you don't you don't walk according to the law that which has been handed down that's the standard and what do we do when we are children of God and being led by the Holy Spirit we're simply walking according to what he's revealed through the Holy Spirit but verse 9 says something else about it in Romans 8 and verse 9 but we are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Well, I'm uncomfortable now. Why? Because you got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's, that's a controversial subject. Why is it controversial? We've seen the beginning of our life in the Spirit. We know it's walking according to the standard that the Spirit has revealed. And what he adds to that is that people that are in the Spirit, there's a condition. You can say, I'm in the Spirit. Why? Because I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm speaking utterances that I've never learned before. Well, that was Holy Spirit on the people, that miraculous gifts. But we're not speaking about that. We're talking about what's the evidence that I'm a true child of God? I don't know sometimes. It's a mystery. It has to do with the Spirit somehow. Yeah, it does. Let's do everything with the Spirit somehow. And he says, you are in the Spirit if the Spirit dwells in you. See, he's not just passing through your memory. And I had a memory verse, and now I've got it down, and I'll live like I want to. It's not coming in one day at services and leaving on Monday morning when I go back to work. It is abiding. It is dwelling in me. His instructions are there. And what I've memorized, I'm going to apply it. He's not going to be just passing through as a visitor. He's dwelling in me. Well, how does that happen? Well, how does Christ dwell in us? Well, he dwells in our hearts through faith. We see that. But I want you to notice in Colossians, the third chapter, in verse 16, that he tells us here that 
in our worship unto him. This will, this will bring forth worship that is pleasing uh, to God. But we're to let the Christ dwell in us. We're to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Let the word of what? I thought we were talking about the Holy Spirit. It didn't say the word of the Holy Spirit. That's what you're on. No, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That which is indeed taught to us from Christ through the Holy Spirit. But let the word of Christ dwell in you. Let it abide in you richly. Because see, that's when we're in, in Christ. Because we're letting his word abide in us. We are in the spirit when we let the Spirit's word dwell in us. Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, this is a command, by the way. This is not some, hey, you, you, you're going to have to come, come on you and you don't know how to explain it. This is a command that you do. That we indeed are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How? How are you going to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Through his word, didn't we begin this way in verse 1 and 2? It wasn't just the Spirit directly upon me. It's the law of the Spirit that brought me life. It's the law of the Spirit that's going to give me direction. It is that law that's required that I'm walking according to that Spirit's revelation. It's all around us. We get a verse that says, God indwell. How does he dwell in us? Christ dwells in us through faith. He dwells in us through the word of Christ dwelling in us richly because the Spirit revealed the word of Christ to us. That's not a mystery. That's revelation. And that needs to get into our heart as Christians to understand that if the Spirit is not dwelling in you, you are not in the Spirit and you're not a child of God. You're not a child of God. How's the Spirit leading you when he's, you don't allow him to dwell in you? I'm going to allow him. I'm going to let his word have its way with me. And I'm going to walk according to that spirit. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit assists us in killing sin. Where do we read that? In Romans 8 and verse 13, this is something the Spirit is doing in our life that we are being told. Paul's not hiding this from us. He says, for if we live after the, the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Well, if I walk according to the Spirit and the law of the Spirit is, is peace and life, I'm going to live and this is eternal life that's is, is there. And so I better be having the Spirit help me and putting to death the deeds of the body. But you know, I feel uncomfortable with that because that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah, you are. But he didn't say you. He said, if you put to death the deeds of the body by what? The Spirit. By the Spirit. How does that happen? Well, how do I know that I should, in the first place, put to death the deeds of the body? Think about that. Because Paul argued in Romans 6 and verse 1 that here's the grace of God and it's so abundantly given. And you know what? Let us continue in sin that grace may abound. You may have some there that are not, not worried about sin. Because see, they see grace is more abundant. So we, we, where do you ever get the idea that we're supposed to kill sin? Do you get that in the world? No, that's living it. That's the good life. Too restrictive to do the things of the Bible. But what do we have the Holy Spirit doing? He first of all tells you, you've got to kill it. Instead of living it. And maybe we're too scared about the Holy Spirit that we forget this is very practical. Because I would not know that I should kill sin in this world if it weren't for the law of the spirit of life. I wouldn't know it. Tell me how. Well, it's just not good for the family. Good for the family? 
We got men being women and women being men and we got killing babies and we don't, we're going to talk about society telling us that that's going to be the case that what's not good for the family? How do I know that I ought to put away sin and tell me what sins I ought to put away? Oh, I've got a list of them. Murder, fornication. Yeah. What about covetousness? Turn with me to Colossians, the third chapter, verses 5 through 10. And the Holy Spirit gives you a list. That's how he's helping you. Not only ought to be killing it, but I'm telling you what to kill. And you might not think some of these are that bad. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. You put away your pornography yet? Or are you living with it? Got that in your locker at work? Nobody can see it. Got to hidden under bed, teenage boys? Where the parents don't see it? After all, you, you got passion. Uh, how would you know that God didn't want you to do that? Holy Spirit, in his word, you, you put to death this passion and evil desire. And you put to death covetousness, which is idolatry. Where in this world would you think covetousness is bad? I just want something. Yeah, I want a little more than everybody. It surely wouldn't be the governments of the world or their economic ways of doing things, of capitalism, if you're going to look covetous is bad there. What about the oligarchy of men who say, well, we'll rule over the people. You think those guys don't have covetousness and their socialism? We'll bring it top down, but we're going to grease our palms. And we're going to take care of ourselves. You look at the systems of the world, and you tell me where covetousness is evil in itself. Oh, it's evil for the other guy to have it. What sins? Holy Spirit's telling you. Verse 8 says, now do put them all away. Wrath, anger, wrath, malice, railing, shameful speaking. You lose your temper? That's just me. Has nothing to do with you. That's just me. Don't worry about it. And shameful speaking out of your mouth? Everybody does that, don't they? Women do that today. Where would you learn? What sins to put to death? You learn it from the Holy Spirit, and you learn it, and you read it, and you're reading it with me right here this morning. This is how the Holy Spirit helps you kill the deeds of the body. But you know what? It's not going to help you a bit if the only sin you hate is somebody else's. That's not going to help you. I hate sin when I see it in somebody else. What about lying? You hate that? Oh, I can't stand people lying to me. I'm talking to you hate lying yourself. Do you hate that sin? Holy Spirit would like to help you. Would you listen to him? All liars are going to hell. You know, I know what sins, and they're my sins. And the Holy Spirit's made it pretty plain. Do you have a plan? Holy Spirit says yes. How do I deal with killing my sin? Well, let the Holy Spirit take you back to when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. How did he overcome temptation that leads to sin? It is written. It is written. It is written. I wonder who had a part in that. Jesus is going back to Deuteronomy. It's written that indeed there's something greater than fleshly bread. It's the words that come out of the mouth of God. I can withstand this. I'm not going to act and do this miracle until God leads me to do that. You can quote scripture, devil. Oh, you're pretty good at that. 
But I'm not going to fall for that trick yet because he says in another place that, that Scripture is to harmonize. Oh, you'll not, you'll let, you'll, he'll not let you stumble and one foot to dash against the stone. And what Jesus does there, as we see in Matthew, the fourth chapter, and verse 7, how does he answer that? He said, again, so again it is written, just harmonize this stuff. It is again it is written, thou shalt not make trial of the Lord thy God. Jumping off the temple is testing God. He didn't tell me to do that. And I don't need that to test his caring about me, devil. It is written. Then he says in verse 10, fall down and worship me. And I'll give you all the kingdoms that you see. He says, get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. I don't know of any sin that's going to stand there and I'm going to be dead of when Satan is not there any longer. He's there to push you over the edge all the time. Satan, get hence. Why? Because I'm going to resist you because it is written. I'll only worship God. That's how Jesus dealt with it. Well, that's Jesus. He has a better memory than I got. He's God. He can remember all those passages. Psalm 119 and verse 11. Jewish boys are going to learn how to handle sin. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to the word of God. Verse 9. According to, sounds like what we've been talking about. In verse 11. Thy word, here's a young man cleansing his way. Thy word, he's talking to God. In relationship with God. By the way, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. My sin I'm taking care of. And I won't sin against you. Where did you get that idea? The Spirit-inspired word. I'm taking the Spirit into battle. The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The word of God. Nothing mysterious, magic about it. But that's part of having the Spirit help you. It's not magical. But it's just simply sitting down and realizing, that's my sin. I hate it. I want to kill it. And I'm going to stay close to that Word of God. I'm going to follow Jesus' example. I know what sins I need to kill. And I know I need to kill it. And don't think, well, the grace of God is going to cover it. He's covered it quite a bit already with the death of Jesus Christ. But see, I'm walking according to the Spirit. I'm minding the things of the Spirit, no longer the things of the flesh. And the Spirit's right there to help you. If you'll read it, if you will study it, if you'll apply it, if you'll let the Word of Christ abide in you and not be just someone that spends a couple of hours and gone. Dwelling of the Holy Spirit. Assistance of the Holy Spirit. And then we come back to our passage. Indwelling the Holy Spirit is there and it helps us and assists us in killing the Spirit. Why? Because we are led by the Spirit of God. How did he lead us? Are you listening? Your mind turned off or you can't think? No, it's... We're led by the Spirit of God. He laid down a law. He laid down a standard that I walk according to. And if he's not doing that, I'm not a child of God. But see, this same Spirit helps some of you in another way. You sit there and think about your sin. You wake up in the morning, think that you're no good. 
seem like you're losing the battle against sin. You feel like you could go in the world at any moment. And you're not too happy with yourself, your spiritual life. God comes to the rescue with his spirit. He said, I want you to know something. We'll call it number four. That the spirit does. Because see, when you are in Christ and you've been redeemed by his blood, it creates a spirit in you if you're a child of God. And what we see in Romans 8 and verse 15 is this other side that the Spirit provides for us. See, it creates in us a spirit. Listen to it. And he contrasts it. Far. Explanation. You need to know what the Holy Spirit, and this is why it's happening. Why, why are you sons of God if you're led by the Spirit? For ye receive not the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Aramaic, Abba, means father. But it means tenderness. And receive not the spirit of bondage, get into fear. We may sin as a Christian. We may not have been doing too good. Spirit supposed to assist me and I've been staying away from his word. Been blaming everybody else for my sins. Not real too concerned about my sin. But now I'm doing better. And I am going to take care of my sin. Now, I am going to be dealing with my problems. And you know what? I wake up not feeling too good about myself. You need to know this part of being a child of God. That when you became saved from your sins, you're in Christ Jesus, and you may be imperfectly minding the Spirit things. You may not have killed all your sins yet. Even though you try and there may be a moment that you really don't like yourself. And you feel like, I'm never going to come out of the grips of sin. Why do you feel that way? Because the same Holy Spirit that's supposed to be leading you is telling you something. See, adoption. Why is it the spirit of adoption? It's no longer a spirit of bondage. I'm not under bondage of sin. I have an avenue I can go to have forgiveness. And I will do better, but I will do better. I'm not going to just say I'm forgiven and go back and do the same thing over again and still have the same problem. No, I'm adding another dimension that I didn't deserve to be a child of God. But the love of God accepted me and he calls it the spirit of adoption. And it causes me to cry. Why would he say it caused me to testify? It caused me to speak. It caused me to say. Because I'm hurting. It causes me to cry. Because I've got a tender God. That I am his child. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. For guiding Paul to write that at such a critical moment in this eighth chapter. I'm going to do better killing the deeds of the body but I can keep doing that because if I were under a system of law that could not justify I'd be going back again under bondage and fearing and fearing what's going to happen in the judgment but now that's not the case because I've read 
the law of the spirit of life. I'm walking according to it. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to help me understand here the things revealed. These are things I need to put to death. Holy Spirit's not going to do that for me. I'm going to do that. But I know now what I've got to work on. At the same time, thank you, God, that you've accepted me as a child of God. I don't have to walk that way any longer with fear and being in bondage all over again. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And notice the adoption. And let me just read verse well, well, we'll talk about it, but look at verse 23, because here's what you're looking forward to. He says, and not only so, but ourselves also have the first fruits of the Spirit. You now, we become Christians, Romans 8. Even we ourselves grow within ourselves, waiting for our adoption. What is it? The redemption of our body. That's the judgment. That's what you scared of. Because, see, you don't, think you're a child of God. Why is a child of God crying? Why is such a comfort when you cry and you hurt? What you have there is somebody that's tender. It's God. God's wrath is over here in killing the deeds of the body. If you don't do that, but see this same God. He's adopted his children. See, you're my child. And you can come to me anytime. And you can cry out in time of hurting, Abba, Father. How would I know that? The Holy Spirit told me. In Romans 8, in verse 15, that I don't have to fear the judgment. Because that's going to be the redemption of my body. And that's going to be the final declaration. I'm adopted. I'm accepted. Well, the Holy Spirit also bears witness. Oh, that's just so difficult. That gets out there on the edge. He's bear witness. I hear that witness word. And I, that's just kind of not very scriptural to me. It's very scriptural. Just like everything else he said in Romans 8, scriptural. But he's not bearing witness to your spirit. Oh, he can do that all right. The Holy Spirit can speak about what Jeremiah 31 said in Hebrews 10, 15. The, the Spirit bears witness to us that there's going to be a new covenant. He's, that's when he's telling you something. But see, this is the context. I'm walking with the Spirit, and He's bearing witness with my Spirit. It's not to my Spirit. It's with my Spirit because I am walking according to His directions. After all, I'm being led by the Spirit. How? Through His Word. Isn't that what verse 14 says? For we're led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. He speaks, and I follow. It's the way you ought to go, and I'm walking with you. I'm in the Spirit. The Spirit's dwelling in me because His Word's dwelling in me, and I'm involved in doing that. So He's bearing witness with, with my Spirit that I am a child of God because we are led, in verse 14, by the Spirit, teachings of the Word. And so we're in fellowship with one another. He's bearing witness with me See, he's telling me, you are a child of God. Oh, imperfect as you are, that's why you've been crying to me. But I'm here to tell you that you're a child of God. You need to make corrections. You need to repent. You need to pray. But don't you get up thinking all the time that I'm not a child of God. That's the devil talking. It's not, you get close to this word. He bears witness with our spirit. And there's a difference bearing witness to you. And a bearing witness with you. You're along with his because he's leading you. You're not leading him. He's leading you. And the final thing, he intercedes for us. Oh, interceding. Holy Spirit interceding. Yeah. That's what verse 26 and 27 says. And in the like manner, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. Now, surely we're going to get in direct operation of the Holy Spirit here. 
you may would never know what's happening. But he wanted you to know it's happening because we need to know this. See, Romans 8 dealing with suffering and persecution. He keeps looking for the glories that are going to be in heaven greater than the things that he is suffering here in verse 18. I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glories that shall be real to us afterwards. And here's this context. And he tells you what our problem is. He says, he helps our infirmity. The Holy Spirit helps our infirmity. For we, not, we, for we know not how to pray as we ought. See, in times of distress, in times where you have no clue of how you ought to go. You're talking to God and you don't know what I ought to be praying for. Do I want out of this mess? Or do I want the strength to go through it, God? Which would it be for me? Because I want out of it. I don't know. I don't know what I ought to pray for. Health? Or, or maybe it's your will that I die. I don't know. But it hurts. And I'm hurting. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us. With groaning which cannot be uttered. I don't think that's the Holy Spirit groaning so much he can't utter it. He's our intercessor. He's, he's the one that's got the answer. I'm the one that's groaning. I don't know what to pray for. With groanings that cannot be uttered. God, I don't know if I'll have the ability tomorrow for somebody to take a dagger and cut my head off in this prison. Give me the strength to go through it. I don't know what I'll pray for. I just help me. I want out of this. But you didn't let John the Baptist get out of it, did you, God? You didn't let Paul get out of it, did you? You let Peter get out of it for a while. God, I've got your word in my mind. I don't know which way to go, but I... I don't know if I can handle that tomorrow because they're telling me that they will save me from my execution if I denounce you. I know the press allows their people to denounce you and it's okay. But I know your word doesn't teach I need to be faithful even if it means death. I've heard that in your word in Revelation 2.10. God, I hope I have the strength. And it's about that time that maybe you need to be turning to 1 Peter 4, 16 and 17 that when you're going through that type of persecution, the, the spirit of God and the spirit of glory rest on you. Maybe that's going to help you face the guillotine or the knife. Spirit, God and spirit of glory rest on you. Where did I get that? Oh, God just revealed it to me. No, he revealed it in his word. We're going to read it and we're going to live close to it. And know that he is behind the scenes and he's going to intercede for us. I don't know. I'm groaning so much. I don't know what to say. I'm crying. I don't know what to say, Lord. Because I know I have to pray according to your will. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit does. You know why? Because he tells you here. Here. He says, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Why does the Holy Spirit know the mind of the Spirit? Because he revealed it. And who is he assisting today? The one who is minding the Spirit. The one who is walking according to the Spirit. The one who is striving to live by the Spirit. But doesn't know exactly what I ought to be praying for at this moment. It wasn't apart from the word. Oh, he does his work. He didn't have to be in you to do that. That's not evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in this chapter also intercedes for us. Where is he? Well, he's in heaven, but he's also in me. But he doesn't have to be there to intercede. This is being done because, see, you're trying to walk by the teachings of the Spirit and he knows what that's about. 
He refilled it. And he can take those groanings that we can't utter. He can give them expression to God. And it will be answered. How? According to the will of God. Thank you, because that's what I want. If it means death or deliverance, be thy will, O oh God. I just don't know what to ask for right now. I know what your word says. I don't know if I'm asking for deliverance or I'm asking to be a martyr. Which would you have me be today? I don't know. In times of that, it is comforting to know that God knows us in those times. We can cry to him recognizing he's our father. He's tender. He's also demanding. And so when you look at those characteristics, all of them involve the Holy Spirit, all are involved as sons of God. What do we have? Well, we're being led by the Holy Spirit because he's revealed it. He's revealed his law, the law of the spirit of life. We are walking according to that revealed will. That's why his spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. We're walking in accordance with that. We know the spirit has revealed not only the plan in which we can avoid sin, but he's told us at the very beginning, you need to be killing sin and you need to be killing your sin. At the same time, when we think we're nothing, he said, you're something. I chose you. You're a child of God. I adopted you. Don't go back under the bondage of fear. You're under the, the grace of God and, the, and the, the, the covenant that you can be made righteous. Get up. Change. Be involved in knowing that he is there to hear your cry. Yes, the wrath of God is serious. Yes, sin is serious. But the same Holy Spirit tells us that God's tender to his children. Don't give up on yourself. He hasn't given up on you. He's ready to hear your song. He's ready to hear you cry, too. And one day, you're going to realize what a joyous thing to you'll be realizing. You were adopted, child of God, when you see the glorious body that we have, when our body is resurrected from the grave. And I can know behind the scenes that I may not be able to understand, but it's been revealed from my learning. That when times of sorrow and grief are so bad that I can't express the type of prayer I need to express. God knows the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows the mind of the Spirit. And He will take what should be our statements of prayer. He will take it in the midst of our groanings that we cannot utter. He'll take them and be fulfilled according to the will of God. As our intercessor to the Father. That's a comfort. Yes. If I'm not led by the Holy Spirit, I'm not a child of God. And here's six things that you can be thinking about that says, I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. How do you become a child of God? Well, the Holy Spirit revealed it. And it was every one of you needs to be baptized in Acts the second chapter. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Some of you? Most of you? No. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of your sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That gift is salvation that the Holy Spirit has been revealing through generations past. Through the prophets. That now both Jew and Gentile could come together and be saved in Christ. The law of the Spirit of life. The gospel has been revealed. And what you learn today, how you can start living that life in the Spirit. And live with confidence, live with determination, live with praise in your heart unto God, even through the difficult times. 
and we offer that Savior to you this morning. Everything's prepared. Won't you come in obedience, obey the gospel, become a Christian as we stand and as we sing.